Good morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. And a warm welcome to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial of Sermon service. Um, a few intimations to draw your attention to. Uh, today is the last opportunity to put a team in for the Men's Guild Quiz Night next Monday. Um, so please see David Brown uh, at the end of the service if you wish to put a team in. Just a reminder that um, there are the sign-up sheets in the vestibule for the two events uh, with St Columbus. There is the um, Coronation Street Party on the 7th of May and also an outing to uh, the Royal Yacht Britannia. And if you want to go to either of those two, can you please put your name on the sheet? And again, it would be nice to have some representation on that. Um, just some advance notice, we're going to try and run our Easter breakfast again this year. And next Sunday there will be a sheet in the vestibule um, if you want to come to that. It's a kind of half nine bacon and egg rolls um, in the, the hall. But we're looking for 20 names before we say we're going to run it or not. So um, we'll have sheets out next week and if we get the 20 names we will run uh, our Easter breakfast. Reminder um, that rather than bringing tins of soup and things, if you can bring toiletries and biscuits for our little food bank in the, the hall. Um, that is what we're discovering um, our Ukrainian friends are needing more of. Um, so if you can bring toothpaste, all those kinds of things, uh, that would be really helpful, um, rather than, say, tins of soup at the moment. Also, just uh, a, a nice thing to tell you, um, if you remember, at the back end of last year, we were given uh, approximately £3,000 to help with the cost of living um, crisis. Well, I can tell you we have helped 38 families to the tune of £3,000 um, over that period. So um, I've had a few letters back from people um, thanking us um, for uh, distributing that money. So pat yourselves in the back, because we wouldn't have got it if we weren't here as a church. So um, it's thanks to you folks that we were able to do that. Um, and we'll just see what happens in the future. But 38 families have benefited from that. Final thing to say is, um, last week um, I was amazed that I'd reached the age of 60. Um, this week I'm even more amazed that there are a couple in the church who have been married for that length of time. And they're sitting to my right here. Because what day is it, Archie, that uh, you celebrate your diamond wedding anniversary? Thursday. Thursday. So we just thought we would get you a wee minding. Aww. On behalf of all your friends in the Old I'll give you the flowers, and I'll give the chocolates. So, and I think you're having a night out sometime with some friends. Yes. So have a wonderful time, and it's great that um, you're able to come over from Australia um, to celebrate that as well. So have a wonderful time, um, and I'm sure you're looking forward to the next 60. <laughs> just finally, we're just going to sit quietly for a moment or two as we remember the people of Ukraine. Thank you. Let's worship God as we sing our opening hymn. I heard the voice of Jesus say. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, you have promised to all who love you a peace that passes understanding. Forgive us that we have failed to make that our own. Teach us to be still and to know that you are God. We rush about, our minds preoccupied by many things, filling our days with frantic, frantic activity, cramming ever more into every moment, our lives dominated by a sense of the unforgiving minute. We strive and hanker after that which is finally unimportant, unable to satisfy. We brood and worry over problems that we cannot change, magnifying little things out of all proportion. Teach us to be still and to know that you are God. Speak to us through the example of Jesus, the way he made time for quietness so that he could speak with you. The need he recognized for space and silence in which to seek your guidance and to reflect on your will. Gracious God, forgive us that for all our busyness, we so often forget the one thing needful, the one thing that really matters, the knowledge of your love. Help us to live each day, each moment, with that foremost in our minds. And so may we find your peace, the rest for our souls that you have promised. Teach us to be still and to know that you are God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here is now as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Anne to read our lessons. Oops. The first lesson is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stands in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff, like that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish.
second reading is from Matthew chapter 5, reading from verses 1 to 16, the Beatitudes. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The Lord bless to us these readings from his holy word and to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Thank you, Anne. We sing again. Blessed are the pure in heart. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. At the beginning of the last millennium, the philosopher and cleric Thomas Aquinas was being given a guided tour around the Vatican by the Pope. There are two reported exchanges between the pair. The first exchange was a question from Aquinas, asking the Pope how many people worked in the Vatican. And the Pope's reply being, about half of them. <laughs> and then the Pope, having shown Aquinas the vast wealth of the Vatican, says, well, Thomas, no longer can we say silver and gold have we none. To which Aquinas replied, true, 
but neither can we say, rise up and walk. The question is, has the Christian church, no matter the denomination, improved over the past thousand years? Or are there still only about half the members active at any one time? Are we still so concerned with money that we've forgotten how to share the good news of Jesus so that it can actually change lives? As a new beginning stretches out in front of us, the challenge is before us to build a church that God can be proud of. So what model of church should we be working to create post-presbytery planning? Do we want to go back to the Aquinas' time? When the church had the power over life and death and frequently used it to suppress those who would question and challenge the accepted order. The churches were full and didn't have any money worries. But were the people really there because they wanted to be or was it out of a fear of reprisals? Is that the kind of church we want? Or maybe we want to return to the Victorian age. When people were proud to be Christians and built those massive cathedral-like structures to show how much they loved God. The bigger the building, the greater the love. But they also kept on stuffing children up chimneys and forcing men and women to work in appalling conditions in the mines and the mills. Is that the kind of church we want? Or maybe you're a fan of the mass rallies of the 50s and 60s and 70s where thousands gathered in football stadiums and heard the likes of Billy Graham challenge them to give their lives to Christ. But when the stadiums emptied, often there was no one there to guide and advise and encourage those who had heard the message. And so soon, like the seed sown amongst the thorns, the message of the good news of Jesus was strangled. Is that the kind of church we want? Or maybe you think that house groups are the answer. Small cells of people meeting in each other's house, sharing on a personal level, encouraging and supporting each other in the group. But where is the visible presence of the gospel? Where is the unity? Where is the corporate strength that is needed to challenge the evils of our day? Is that the kind of church we want? For me, the message of the Gospels is that Jesus didn't come to create a structure or even worse, an institution. He didn't come to form a committee. He didn't come to form a a system of church government. Jesus came to change the hearts and the minds of men and women. Because he knew that when people opened their lives to God, then they would work together. They would share together. They would grow together. If we want to create a new church post-planning, then we can do no better than to return to the model that Jesus followed. That what counts isn't the number of buildings or structures or systems, but how people show their love for God. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the most radical and challenging sermons, manifestos, agendas, call it what you like, ever recorded. Jesus was executed because of the revolutionary nature of his teaching. And even if today, if taken seriously, it will challenge the standards of every government, every organization, every man, woman, and child in the world. The problem is that we have become so familiar with parts of its message that we've forgotten that taken as a whole, it is really a blueprint of what a Christian ought to be like. And what every Christian ought to be working towards. The Sermon on the Mount is God's guide to living a fulfilled and God-like life. Jesus begins the sermon by talking about the kind of characteristics that ought to be found in a Christian. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then he goes on to talk about how those characteristics can be used to make the world a better place. Jesus knew that while discipleship begins on a personal level, it must grow and develop and change to an external level. Otherwise it becomes selfish and false. 
Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, words that we're all familiar with. But how many of us still read them and immediately think that they are relevant to us? That they're talking about me? Do I see myself as a peacemaker? Am I persecuted for Christ's sake? Am I pure in heart? I don't think there are many of us here today would claim to think in those terms. And yet these traits are all characteristics that every Christian ought to be developing in their life. They are what we are all supposed to be working at, just as Jesus worked at them in his own life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All of us ought to be trusting solely in God and not in our possessions or wealth or even our friends and family. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. All of us ought to be hungry to see peace and justice for all. Blessed are the peacemakers. All of us ought to be out there in the world working proactively for peace. And when we do these things, when we try to develop these characteristics, not all of course at once, not all at once of course, we discover inside are growing the fruits of God's Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. And when the fruits of God's Spirit begin to grow and flourish, then you discover a person who is a powerful force for God. And when two or three of those people get together, you discover an even greater force for God. And when a whole church of these people come together, you have a force that is capable of changing the world. The church we have to create post-COVID and post-presbytery planning has to be one which is filled with men and women who are trying to take the challenges of the Sermon on the Mount seriously. Men and women who are trying to make these characteristics not even second nature, but part of their very being. All the Christians that I have ever met who have had any kind of impact on the world around them have all had one thing in common. That being, when you are in their company, you have a sense of being in the presence of Jesus. You can see the characteristics of him in their lives. God is involved in every area of their life. Without it being obvious or over the top, it's not about false airs or graces. It's not an act. It is quite simply the work of the Holy Spirit flowing through them. And it's a joy to be in their company. You know that one of my heroes was Eric Little of Chariots of Fire fame. And he said that even when he was running, it had to do with God. And he said that when he ran well, he felt that somehow he was praising God because he was using a God-given talent. And his style of running reflected that. Because he said that he threw his head back so that God could see him smile as he ran. How we need more people like that. People who are prepared to work at being a Christian. Not for personal gain, but so that the world might be a better place. And if we want a church that God can be proud of post-planning, then it has to begin with you and me, the individual, taking seriously the challenges of the Beatitudes. But it doesn't end there. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus then goes on to say that Christians have to become the salt of the earth and the light to the world. In other words... The reason for letting God work in your life to change you in the way that Jesus is talking about in the sermon is so that you can make a difference in the world. When you look at the great Christians of history, the reason that they are remembered is because of how they have stood out from the crowd. Because of the things they have achieved in the world. Mother Teresa stood out by living in poverty with the people she wanted to help. What greater example of being poor in spirit could you want? William Wilberforce suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune as he battled to abolish slavery. What better example is there of hungering and thirsting for righteousness? John Paul II played a huge role in the defeat 
and the threat of communism. What better example of peacemaking can you think of? Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount because he knew that the qualities he was talking about were needed in his day and they are still needed in this world today. As Christians, we need to be putting these characteristics into practice. We need to show the world that we do indeed have something concrete to offer. That we can add spice to life. That it's not just mere words that we have to share. And one of the ways that we can do that is to take the opportunities that are before us. Since we received the money from the sale of the farmhouse at Sessionfield, we've re-roofed the church hall and begun the update of our facilities so that they are fit for purpose in the 21st century, so that we can offer it to our community to use as they see fit, so that we can make a difference to the lives of the people who live in and around this church. We may not have the personnel to make a difference, but we do have the facilities. And next Sunday, a group of Ukrainian refugees are going to start using our halls as a meeting place. And hopefully that is just the beginning. If we put our hearts and our souls into this, we will see the kingdom of God grow. If we want to build a new church for a new age, then we have to begin the building process in our own lives. We have to start allowing God to work in our lives so that the qualities and characteristics that are to be found in the Beatitudes are also found in our lives. And then, and maybe this is the hard bit, we have to leave the security of our buildings and we have to go out into the world and get our hands dirty doing the kinds of things that Jesus did to help people in need. Our Christian future will not be secured by structures or buildings. It will be secured by returning to the teaching of Jesus and by allowing God to work through us. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts and to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering. Father God, you bless us day by day. And today, out of our gratitude for all that you have done for us, we bring this, our offering, before you, asking that you would accept it, bless it, and use it to build your kingdom, to build your people, to build your church. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Brian McEnroy to lead us in prayer. Uh, prayers for other people. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Help us to do your work with a light heart and a ready smile. We thank you for the security of life that we know, for homes, for food, for family and friends, for the respect we so easily take for granted. 
Gracious God, we think of the growing plight of young people in our world, of the seven and a half billion children who will die needlessly this year because nobody cares. We think of those children who receive no education, who are forced to flee their homes because of wars, who are malnourished, orphaned, or stricken with preventable disease. God of the poor and the powerless, we stand before you as citizens of a very wealthy and powerful nation and ask that you would show us how to help others. For so many, the world is such a dark and depressing place. We pray for refugees driven from their own countries by injustice, war or hunger. We especially pray for those living in anguish, fear and violence in Ukraine and those affected by the terrible earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. We think of those who are frightened because they are ill. Reassure them that because of the knowledge you have given to us, Many diseases can now be cured. Help them to have confidence in those with medical knowledge to care for the sick. Give them courage, hope and peace and the knowledge that you are with them in their pain and their suffering. Father God, if it matters to you, does it really matter to us? If you hear the cries of the poor, help us to hear the same. If you see the effects of injustice, help us to see the same. If you act to change the plight of those in dire need, help us to do the same. Move us to act. Lord, above all, you know the worries and concerns that family life can bring. We lay before you those known to us who are in need of your special help at this time. In this moment of silence, we place their names into your loving care in the certain knowledge that all will be well. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, knowing that you listen to all our prayers and always answer them. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Just before we sing our closing hymn, can I remind you of the various lists out in the rest of you? And if you want to sign up for any of the things, please do so. We close by singing Angel Voices Ever Singing.
may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore. God bless and keep safe.